Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. Today, our webinar is talking about how to become a Surefoot practitioner. We've had a lot of people ask, and of course, because of COVID, we've had a lot of delay. And, you know, there's just not a lot we can do when the pandemic is kind of still present and, and causes us grief. Um, but it doesn't mean we haven't been working hard on this whole idea. And so today I have brought along Leslie Abel. She works with me on all of this stuff. She is the queen of curation. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And, um, you know, it's so funny how you, you think you're on a track and you're going to be able to complete that task. And then something comes along and bumps you back and you go, oh my God, I got to make the base of the pyramid so much bigger to get to the top. And so that's what we've been doing. Um, I met a lovely woman last summer in July at my Surefoot workshop in New Hampshire, which I am going back to do this year. So put that on your calendar, July in New Hampshire. It's a lovely time and a beautiful place. And since I lived in New Hampshire, um, it's kind of like going back to old stomping grounds when I go there. Um, but anyway, this woman uh, is fabulous because she's getting us organized. Um, and when I sat down and talked with her for an hour, I realized that I had a lot more admin work to get done in order to make it so much easier for you as someone who wants to be a practitioner. So that's what we've been working on. And it's actually called a LEAP chart. And Leslie, do you remember what LEAP stands for? It's like learning, education, and development, I believe. Plan. Plan. And Plan. Yeah. So I think it's, um, yeah. And basically what it's doing is it's organizing us. So we've been curating all of our content that we've been generating. And believe me, after 30 years, I've generated a lot of content. Um, so in <laughs> addition to the Surefoot stuff, we took a deeper dive and Leslie has been curating all of my articles. We're curating the webinars um, and all the Surefoot material and of course, tons of video. Um, and the point of all this is so that it's really easy for us to, to be able to grab information and to, um, put information out. Now, as part of this process, one of the things I've done is put up articles. I've created a Patreon account. And if you don't know what Patreon is, it's basically a monthly subscription where you have access to content. So um, I've created several different tiers in Patreon. One is if you want to just support webinars with Wendy, because we're going to continue and I'm signing up more guests as we speak. And um, we're just gonna keep going with webinars. So if you value the webinars and you find the information really helpful, it'd be awesome if you would support us on Patreon, it's five bucks a month. Um, and then I am putting up uh, Surefoot videos um, on Patreon where you can subscribe to that. And the content is not um, narrated or anything. It's um, basically what's up there so far is two very interesting case studies that I went up to Robin Hood's place in July of 2019, and we filmed two horses over three days and followed their progress in terms of using Surefoot. They were very different horses. One was a Mustang and one was a thoroughbred off the track. So you can see how I approached both of these horses and how I progressed from physiopad all the way to pods actually. Um, so that's just really great as practitioners, if you wanna kind of see how one might progress with a horse, obviously this was a condensed period of time. And I've chunked that video, those videos down into about 10 minute segments. Cause I know sometimes it's just easier to watch a short segment and get back to your life. Um, so that's all up on Patreon. I will be adding more material up there. Um, I have more, I have a lot of footage. And um, so that's just, but it's just the, the content, right? And then what Leslie's been working on is curating all of the materials that we've been generating for Surefoot practitioners. So Leslie's gonna walk us through, she's created a PowerPoint, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> the, 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 she, the graphics will be stylized in our lovely Surefoot style um, when we get it completed to the point where it's ready to be stylized. And we're also, moving all of our um, content management, our, our customer management over to a new platform. We're moving over to HubSpot because currently um, we have you folks living in a lot of different places and it's really hard for us to track. We wanna make all of that easier and more seamless so that you have a better experience and you're not trying to figure out who to contact um, or what to do. So that's what we're doing now and we should be completed with that uh, in about six weeks. 
So as you can see, we've got a lot of stuff going on in the background. The whole point of telling you all of this is that what we're trying to do is make your experience of passing into our system and becoming a Surefoot practitioner as simple and clear as possible. And I know that at times it's been confusing and we've like set up a workshop and then canceled the workshop or, <laughs> you know, you've sent in your application. I know a bunch of people have sent in their application and then we've ghosted you. Well, that's because the data got lost um, <laughs> and we didn't have a, a good system in place to track it. And so that's what we're solving. We are going to completely revamp the, the way we track people who want to come into the path. Uh, process and how we follow you and keep your information updated and everything. Um, it'll make our lives easier. It's going to hopefully just be uh, um, an invisible experience for you and that you don't notice it or have frustration with it. Um, so in the meantime, please bear with our growing pains. These were both huge things that we didn't anticipate doing. Um, like I said, we started doing the leap chart in July. We're still working on it, but we're way down the road now. Leslie's Was it only just July? Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Leslie's been living in this spreadsheet. Like a bit over <laughs> and she feels like she'll never get done with. And I've been like dumping all this content <laughs> that has been stuck in my computer up where she can and anybody can access it, where we'll have access to it to make it more seamless and easier. Um, you know, like any organization we're going through growing pains, the, the only positive thing about COVID is that it's let us get this done without trying to like do a bunch of other things public facing, which would have made this transition even harder. So bottom line, 2022, we thought that 2021 would be when we got back to doing workshops, but it looks like it's going to be 2022. We're already starting to plan some workshops. I've got one scheduled for Pennsylvania in March. Um, I've got the one in July in New Hampshire and one in June coming up in Colorado. Um, and um, we're still trying to figure out Europe. We're still trying to figure out the UK. Um, you know, that's where things get a little bit uncertain at this point, but we haven't forgotten you. And we're looking at some other ways to, to help you along on that path. Um, and so let's get started into what Leslie's been up to so that you can see that we actually have a plan. <laughs> um, Surefoot Clinic in Oregon, Washington. Yeah, I probably need one out, out in that side of the country. We don't have one planned yet. Um, so we'll get started. We'll start talking about what the process is to become a one hoof practitioner in particular, and then, um, you know, ask any questions you wanna ask, pop them in the chat, pop them in the Q and A, we'll answer them live as best we can. And um, the goal is to just let you know, we, we are really making progress. We're wanting to get this thing off the ground this year um, in a much bigger way. Um, and we're so glad you've been patient with us with everything that's going on. So thanks. And uh, Leslie, take it away. All right. So I'm just going to share my screen and pop up the little PowerPoint that I uh, created here to keep us on track. <laughs> and of course, Wendy, feel free to jump in at any point. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining us today. As Wendy said, and just to kind of piggyback a little bit onto something that she said when she was telling you about the lovely lady, Diana, that she met that's helping us with this process. Um, you know, one of the first step for us was after meeting with Diana and talking about um, learning and development and as a whole and how to create a, a good educational program. Um, one of the, the first step for us was to decide, okay, wait a minute, what does a practitioner even need to know? You know, what is a list? What we, we had to really make a list of those things. Of what does a practitioner need to know? And we, what we came up with was, oh my gosh, there are a lot of things that are not always um, intuitive, you know? And it's, you know, everything from how do you offer a pad to a horse or present a pad to the horse for the first time to picking up a hoof to placing the hoof on the pad, safety issues, environmental issues, all of those kinds of things. And so when we kind of drew up that, that list, it led us to the next step, which was, well, how we have that knowledge. Wendy has that knowledge. She has, you know, piles and piles of content that she's created over 30 plus years of career. But how do we, what knowledge pieces do we have or 
do we not have in our bank of content that we need for um, to teach those skills to the practitioner in case you didn't already know how to do some of those things. So, and, and that's one of the things Diana helped us identify is the difference between skills, basically think technique, knowledge, the things you need to know about it, and then aptitude, the things that you come to Surefoot with in your own toolkit already. Um, an example okay. of aptitude is public speaking. Um, not everybody's really great at public speaking. You're not required to be great at public speaking to enter into the Surefoot practitioner track, but at a certain level, that becomes important when you're working with larger groups. So Diana really helped us recognize that we have to identify skills, knowledge, and aptitude as three separate categories so that when we outline each hoof level, we're very clear about what the skill is, what the knowledge base is, and what the aptitude is for those levels. Correct. And so I think going through that whole process has sort of led us to some of the things we're going to show you today. Um, and keep in mind, this is still in process. It's still evolving. Um, but we're sort of now at the part that I get really excited about, which is bringing the knowledge pieces and the skill pieces and meshing them together into curriculum. So um, as you know, what I've got up here on the screen right now are our different hoof levels, of course, as you may or may not be aware of already, that we have different levels um, within the practitioner program, um, starting with one hoof and going all the way up to four hoof. And as you pass through each of these levels or you start to get authorized in each of these levels, um, there are different requirements um, for each level and then different expectations that um, uh, we have as a company for that level of practitioner. Does that make sense? When did I say that right? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, there's that, with each level, there's uh, more responsibility back to the parent company, if you will. Um, we'll talk about, uh, I don't know if you want to do that right now, Leslie, is talk about the basics of each level. Yeah. Do you want to just kind of give a little overview of each yeah. level, just kind of broad sense? So one hoof, that's the upper left hand corner, yellow dot, uh, circle. Um, when you're a one hoof, that's your entry, entry level. And that's primarily learning the technique of using surefoot pads. So th there's a lot of uh, techniques or skills um, when first starting out. And so that level basically focuses on you attaining those skills. And, um, and then as a result of attaining those skills, you can work individually with people with their horses. So um, it's kind of where you get ex uh, more experience using Surefoot in your practice, combining it with the other techniques that you may do, um, or doing Surefoot sessions solely on their own, but that's a one hoof level. Two hoof level, you're, you can start to work in small groups. So this is where say a barn wants you to come in and work with a couple of their customers, a couple of their horses. You go in, it's a couple hours, it's a small group. There's not uh, an audience per se involved. You're not trying to entertain an audience and work with the horses. Um, if you work with a horse under saddle, it would be one horse at a time. And so here you're starting to get more experience dealing with groups and answering more questions to the, to the general public um, and kind of growing in that base of knowledge of how to work with, with a couple of horses at the same time. Uh, a three hoof can then start to do uh, clinics. You can do day long clinics where you might have, um, as an example, when I've done clinics, I've had eight horses and I work with two horses at a time in semi-private, might bring them back in the afternoon, uh, much more with an audience now that you can have auditors observing as well as participants working with their horses in the pads. So now we've added the, the piece of more public speaking, being able to you know talk to a broader audience, answer a lot more in-depth questions and that sort of thing. And then finally, four hoof is where you are able to train one hoof practitioners. So this is where um, you have now got sufficient experience, knowledge, and training that you can start imparting that information to other equine professionals so that they can start into the, the Surefoot practitioner tracks. So that's kind of in a nutshell. Um, Leslie's going to go into a bit more detail here in the following slides. 
Yes, and all of that information um, is very detailed on our surefitequine.com website under the training tab. So if you are just curious about each individual level and you wanna get a little bit more detail, you can go in there and there are some really good um, PDFs that are uploaded in there that you can read about each hoof level as I follow in my chair, um, <laughs> if you'd like to get- The Surefoot Equine website. Yeah. Okay, so this is not a graphic that you have to read all of while we're sitting here, but I just wanted to give you kind of a, an idea or a visual of what we are going to um, ultimately, what we're trying to get to, which is a timeline and roadmap of how to become a practitioner. This particular roadmap is for all levels. So basically there are six steps to becoming a practitioner and the steps are basically the same for each level, but what is required within that step is different for each level. Um, so, and Leslie's got um, slides that break each one of these down. Yeah. So you don't have to try and squint yeah. at your screen. Don't have to squint and read this. I'm going to move on and we're going to actually break down each step, but we will come up with, and this will be all beautiful and stylized when we actually uh, send it out to people or put it on the website. Um, but it'll be one document that kind of lists everything. Um, so we'll just go through steps one by one. And um, so the first step is just to apply, right? That's easy. Um, we have the online application on our website, shafetiquan.com under the training tab. Uh, you can fill out your application, pay any app applicable fees. So there will be at some point an application fee. Currently there is not, um, but there will be uh, probably this year, right? Wendy? Yeah, I, mean, I, I would when think it's... Um... You know, we were having planning on bringing in the fees starting this year, but then last year wasn't what we expected. So um, we won't bring in fees until all of this is formal and finished. So if you sign up and get to a workshop before we get all that done, you will not pay an application fee. Just yeah. word of oh, the incentive for <laughs> <laughs> right? Because while we're when we finally make an announcement that we're going to charge an application fee, then will just grandfather those people who have applied and gone through the approval step. They have to at least be approved and hopefully registered for a workshop and we'll waive those fees. But after that, we'll have fees. Right, so to receive approval, that is um, not quite as, as formidable as it sounds, but basically, you know, you have to be an equine professional to become a practitioner. And so that is, we have a, a wonderful lady in our office, Alex Hamilton, who goes through and once the application comes in, she goes in and just basically makes sure you are who you say you are. You know, if you give her your Facebook link or your website link, she goes out and just makes sure that, you know, everything's on the up and up. And then she will send you an email with your approval. Um, um, on that, it, you don't have to be an equine professional to take a workshop. No, just no. so you know, I'm sure there's some people here. Um, you know, if you just want more information and knowledge on how to use Surefoot, you are more than welcome at any workshop. Um, you're just not on the practitioner track. Okay. But, you know, we love having people that just want more information and really enjoy Surefoot to come to the workshops. They're always fun. You ask great questions. And I, I always enjoy that. So, so that's not a problem. Um, and just when you fill out an application, if you have a business name, please, please put in your business name. And also just make sure you fill out your full address, right? Street, town, state, zip code, country. Um, sometimes we find people just put in part of their address and we have to guess a lot. So it just makes our life easier if you do fully fill out that application. I think we finally made it um, required fields just because um, so many times people would just put in a street address. And that was it. <laughs> yeah. um, so we do kind of look at that in terms of ability to complete a form. Uh, just <laughs> <saying>. <laughs> um, and let me just speak to register for a Surefoot workshop. So on the website, there is a calendar. And when we have workshops, they will be listed on the calendar. And when you fill out your application, you can say who you would like as an instructor, you can also say which workshop you would like, but of course we'll be adding workshops. And one of the goals of moving over to the, to the new system is that we can track 
general locations. And so if there's a workshop, say, that's coming up in Germany, we'll just let people know in Europe, hey, there's this workshop. You know, if you don't speak German or you don't speak English, if it's in English, obviously you wouldn't want to go. But we want you to know where the workshops are, just in case you might be traveling and go, wow, I can get to this workshop. That's awesome. So, um, you know, we're still um, getting workshops up and listed. Um, I'm still bringing on workshops for this year. I'm really hoping that we won't have the problems we had last year where we would schedule and have to cancel. That's kind of a pain for everybody. Um, we're really hoping that that's, we're beyond that this year. Fingers crossed, okay. Let me ask you a question, Wendy, that may be a question out there. So if someone wants to apply to become a practitioner and there's not a short foot workshop on the calendar in their area, should they go ahead and fill out an application anyway, just to, if nothing else, it gives you ideas of where there's interest? Absolutely. If you want to become a practitioner, go fill out an application. It really helps us in terms of figuring out a location for a workshop. You know, if we see there's a whole bunch of people down in Florida, we're going to figure it out. Right. So, um, if you already applied, you shouldn't need to apply again. Um, Cause Carol's asking, um, do I need to apply if I've already attended a workshop? Oh, um, if you've already attended a workshop, that's a really good question. Um, uh, Leslie, I don't have a simple answer for that. I guess the answer is yes. Um, you can't, it doesn't hurt to send in too many applications but it does hurt not to do them. So, um, or, or Carol, what you could do is just go ahead and contact Sue Smith. Um, Sue Smith. Uh, sir, and I don't see, I will pull up her contact information and pop it in the chat. So you can contact Sue directly, but Leslie, that's a really good question that I don't have a good answer to. If you've already attended a workshop, but did not fill out an application. Is no, that the if they already attended one and they want a refresher. Um, do they then reapply so that we have them in the system? Um, it's a really, a really good, question. good question. You know what? Um, Leslie, make a note. <laughs> yeah, I've got it. I've got it. We do. Okay. Why we hadn't considered that one, I don't know, but it's a really good question. So um, <laughs> okay. I'm just trying to get grab Sue's email address here. Um, I'll tell you what, if you, are you going to, so you're going to give her someone to contact or because she can contact me and then we can figure Let's it do out. That. Offline. Okay, why don't you put your email address in the chat there? Um, okay. And you can always contact info at surefootequine.com. But that's a really good question, Carol. Thanks for asking, because um, uh, we hadn't we hadn't worked that. Well, see, this is why we're doing this, to figure out with the holes that we still need to fill. Okay, so Carol, just if I put my email address in the chat, if you and anyone, you're welcome to email me with any other questions as well. But if you'll just shoot me an email with your contact info and I will, I will get you an answer. Yep. <laughs> we will figure it out. Yep. Okay, so moving on. If I can go. There we go. So step two in our process is the learning step. So the other, so another piece of what we've added in the last year and that probably the last year, I guess, is we've added a online learning piece. So mostly that sort of was born out of the fact that when you couldn't travel, you know, travel was very limited, short, the workshops were very limited, if happening at all. And so we wanted to try to at least find a way to get some education out there where people could either start working on it or um, have some sense of what they could be working on on their own at home and whatnot. And then I think we have even used the online course a couple of times, the pre-workshop course, a couple of times before your latest workshops, right, Wendy? Yep. And I think you told me that it was actually very um, It was great. Helpful. So um, the last clinic I did at Sue Smith's, uh, people had done the online portion first. And what it meant was there was a lot of stuff I didn't have to cover in our together time, in our in-person time, so we could do more important stuff. So, you know, some of the online stuff is just kind of reiterating what you need to know, um, some of the knowledge base and pieces like that, but it really made a difference in terms of how far we could progress during the workshop because people had taken that online course. Um, you are required to do the post-workshop part. Um, and what we find is some people have 
have not completed their post workshop survey and questions. So, you know, it's really important to go back and do the post. Um, I just want to kind of interject one thing here. During all this COVID stuff, one of the things we did was starting to allow some people to do case studies in advance of taking a workshop. Um, what we discovered is you, we don't want you to do all of your case studies before you do a workshop. And part of the reason for that is that we want to see the, the progression of the case studies prior to the workshop. And then of course, you've learned new information at the workshop and then how you employ that new information in your case studies post-workshop. Ultimately, ultimately, when we get past COVID, we all keep saying that, um, the, all of the case studies will need to be done after you take a workshop. But again, we're still in this funny transition period. So if you, especially if you're in a location where there, there's no workshop, currently, and it doesn't look like we're going to have one um, anytime too soon, um, get in touch with us. We'll connect you with Jo Watman. She does all the case studies. In fact, next week, we're going to do a webinar on how to do case studies. Um, and so you can get started with some of them. And Jo gives really, really good feedback. Um, one of the things we're going to do in the webinar next week, talk about case studies, is show you what not to do and then show you a really good case study. Um, the whole purpose of the case studies is just to have somebody, first of all, have you watch yourself. You know, the question is, would you submit this if you were sending it in to be reviewed? You know, did you watch it yourself and kind of critique and maybe decide, no, nah, I don't want to send that one. I'll do it again. Um, and also to give you good feedback, because ultimately, you know, we want you to be really good at what you do. Um, and we want to be able to help you in that process. So, um, you know, Joe's gotten really good at doing case studies and giving feedback. I'm really looking forward to that webinar. But like I said, um, currently, the, uh, we are allowing people to do some case studies in advance of taking a workshop, but that will change once we can get back to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> right. So the, the online courses, as Wendy said, are going to be required um, both the pre-workshop and the post-workshop. And they're right now they're very, very basic, um, but we are working to build more sort of um, more courses to sort of get a little bit more well-rounded education experience. So there will be things about surefoot pads, but then there's also going to be some courses about you know marketing 101, how to market yourself and your services once you have completed your workshop and you're and you're authorized and you're ready to go and well, how do I start, how do I get started? So there's going to be some other sort of mini courses and things like that that hopefully will help you um, just in the course of your business. Uh, and then step three is prepare. So this is prepare to do case studies, prepare to um, start your business with Surefoot. So this is going to be in some of the hoof levels, not not hoof hook, not one hoof and not two hoof, but in three and four, um, there are some recommendations that are required, um, such as you know being recommended by a three or four hoof to become a three hoof, uh, four hoof, that kind of thing. So in this uh, step is where you would submit those recommendations as a one, again, as a one hoof and a two hoof, you won't need to worry about that. Um, acquire any necessary short foot paths. So if you are just getting started and you don't have any pads at all, there are certain, um, for each level, there's a certain amount of pads that are required to use with your case studies, to use in your case studies. So for a one hoof, for example, it's two, um, a minimum of two pairs of different density pads. So that could be a set of hard and a set of firm slants or a set of firm and firm slants, my personal favorite. Um, so just that you have two different densities and two different, um, yeah, two different densities to be able to use in your case studies to show some variation. And just remember as a business, it's a write-off, right? These are the tools wow. you can trade. You, you need them to do Surefoot. So um, just keep that in mind that it's a business write-off. Right. And so um, uh, you also would have your certificate of insurance at this point. If you don't have insurance, you know, I have a business, so I carry liability insurance to protect myself. I'm assuming that most equine professionals probably do. But if in the event that you don't, this is where you would um, start to think about getting your certificate of insurance so that you can just cover yourself. Um, 
And then you would choose your case study horses. So when you were going to say something? Uh, okay, sorry, I thought you were going to say something. No, uh, so you, uh, I was going to say something, so, uh, but I forgot what it was. Okay. Okay. So um, this is where you would choose your case study horses. So again, each uh, level is required to do some case studies. Uh, one hoof is six video case studies, so that's six different horses, so that's a lot. Um, and my suggestion, and I think I'm right when I say this, is that would be to get a sort of variety of horses, you know, maybe different sizes and shapes, different disciplines if you can. If you have access, um, different temperaments, you know, just to show that you uh, have some experience working with the different types of horses, because as we all know, they're all kind of individuals, um, just like people. I, I can't remember, and we'll talk about this when we get to case studies, whether or not you can use the same horse for two case studies if it's like a progression. But that's a good question oh, for you. Joe when we do the case study mm -hmm. uh, webinar. So keep that one in mind. Um, yeah. You know, we, uh, the certificate of insurance, it's just really important. Um, we carry a policy on the product, but you know everybody in this litigious society needs to carry some type of insurance when you're working with horses. Obviously, um, we all recognize that horses can be dangerous. And while we take every precaution to when we approach a horse and make sure everything's okay, you know, um, we can't guarantee it's going to be 100% of the time. So that's just really important to protect you. Um, mm -hmm should anything happen. Um, oh, and then step, this is supposed to be step four, typo. <laughs> I looked at this thing a million times, didn't catch that, took this down. Um, Let's so talk about the hind four. legs on that horse either. <laughs> hey, I drew that. I'm just kidding. I, oh, yeah. I did not draw it. <laughs> That's way too good for what I could draw. <laughs> okay. Um, right. out behind. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little out behind, sorry. Um, Step four is practice. So this is where you're going to uh, actually start practicing with your pads, um, practicing what you've learned so far, and then starting to video your case studies, submitting your case studies. And you're gonna be, what we wanna see, and, and Wendy and Joe will talk more about this in the case study section, uh, webinar next week, but is you know that you can demonstrate the knowledge and the skills that we've been talking about this whole time or during your process, you know, safe, how to work, safe, eh, cannot speak anymore, how to handle a horse safely, um, picking the right environment, you know, very important. You can't, you don't want to just do the pads just anywhere, you know, you want to make sure that it's an environment that's conducive to learning um, and quiet. And then how to um, submit your case studies and what to consider when you're filming your case studies, you know, um, we had somebody send in a video and this, at, uh, not that long ago, I don't think, and it was a super windy day and all you could really hear was wind noise. Well, it's difficult. So we want to make sure that, you know, when we're providing feedback that we actually hear what you're saying and that we can, um, you know, there's not loud noises like the farrier in the background pounding or, you know, or wind noise or, um, you know, probably wouldn't do it during a thunderstorm, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Just you want to think about setting, you know, setting, uh, setting up for success. We always talk right. about setting up for success. So you want to do that with your case studies and do not submit all the case studies in one day. In other words, the whole point of the case studies is that you send in a case study, Joe reviews it, gives you feedback, you make any changes, you send in another one. So don't just go out and film all six of them in one day and think that she's going to be happy. I can guarantee she will not. And she will <laughs> your case studies. So again, we'll talk more about that um, because we get a lot of questions on the case studies. So that's why we're going to do just a whole webinar just on that. And then submitting any other required videos at the three and four hoof level, there are some other videos that are required besides case studies. Um, for example, as a three hoof, you uh, believe it's a 10 minute video that we ask that you submit of you basically running a small group session as a two hoof so um, that we can see. And then as a four hoof, I believe it's a, um, you know, a another 10 minute video of you running a clinic or um, some sort of three hoof practitioner um, session that you've done. Um, so, and those are all, again, all the details of each hoof level and their requirements are listed on individual pages on the website, on our website. Okay. And then evaluate. 
which is, this is where you're going to start receiving some of your case study feedback. So um, Joe is really good at providing feedback. She will go in and fill out a form for each one of the case studies that you've submitted. And it will have, you know, what you, what she feels like you've done really well. Um, she'll make notes on anything that she thinks uh, could be improved um, and give you examples. Sometimes I think she even adds some uh, video of, of what she's talking about, or she'll even you know, go in and, and get the timestamp of, of your video that so you have specifically know exactly where she's talking about in your video so you can go back and rewatch it. And then if you, this would be the moment where you would also uh, resubmit any Thing if you needed to, if you needed to go back and video something fresh and, and resubmit it to her, you could do that. Yeah, and it's a minimum of six case studies. She may ask you for an additional one if she feels like it's necessary. Um, you also have to remember she's in Australia, so mm -hmm. she's on a completely different time zone. And so if you don't hear from her immediately, just recognize that she's in Australia and she's got a full-time job. So, um, you know, that she's not solely dedicated to doing case studies, but she does a really good job when she gets there. And we just love the kind of feedback that she gives everybody. So, um. And then the last and final step is, yay, you're authorized. So you, <laughs> once you've gone through all of the other steps, you'll achieve your authorization. Um, Joe will send you a certificate of authorization. And then you can start marketing your Surefoot services that are appropriate to your level and then begin making horses happy, <laughs> which is ultimately what we all want to do. Yeah. And one of the common questions that we get is, what do I charge for a Surefoot session? So worry. the way we look at it is you are just adding to your skill set. What are you worth? Um, if you feel that Surefoot adds value to what you offer to your customers, then consider raising your rates. But we do not set a fee or a, we don't tell people what to charge for a Surefoot session because, you know, it may be that you're there and you are a massage therapist or you're, uh, you know, you have other skills and the horse needs 10 minutes of Surefoot and he's toast. Um, you know, and then you're stuck with what do you do for the rest of the time if you're charging by time, you know, so it gets complicated. Um, also, we're just dealing with people in all parts of the world. So it's really about looking at what your pricing scheme is and then what this is worth. You feel this is worth as an additional um, service that you offer to your customers. Um, so, you know, that's a really common question. And the, the answer, you know, when it comes down to it, what I find is that a lot of people don't charge what they're worth. <laughs> I and mean, maybe adding Surefoot to your toolkit will help you recognize your worth more and charge for that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's the thing is it, it's, um, the, I have gone in at times and literally the horse is 10 minutes and he's toast and I can't do any more with Surefoot, but of course I can have other skills and I can employ those other skills. And especially this is true at the one hoof level. That's the whole point is you've added to your, to your skill set. Um, and it, in many cases, what people report is that it makes the other techniques easier to do. In other words, if you're doing myofascial release and you have a horse on a surefoot pad, either before or during the session, say a full physio, um, it makes those releases go deeper and further um, with you know, less effort. So the other thing is that um, sometimes uh, certain techniques are really hard on your body and Surefoot can be a really nice break, give yourself a little break, but also it's so powerful um, that it, it, you know, it, as you know, as everybody knows how powerful Surefoot can be to individual horses. Um, Leslie, do you have anything more on, on this part? Um, the only thing that also I was gonna show is just, um, this slide, oh, which yeah. again, nobody needs to go, you don't have to try and read this or anything. I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of where we're going, what we're thinking, where this is the roadmap and we'll have one of these, we'll have our individual roadmap for each hook level. And at each hook level, then we'll break it down to um, a, a course, you know, course curriculum for each hook level. So each, each level, no matter whether you're starting out as a one hoof or you're trying to become a three hoof or a four hoof, you will have curriculum that is for your level and is customized to that level. So while there's a lot of things that are similar to each level, the application and that kind of thing, um, the submitting videos, whatnot, 
each level will have its own um, curriculum. So, um, and then the only other thing that I had, Wendy, was just, which you answered a little bit of this already as we kind of have gone through, but um, anything so, else? You but to talk about? It's a great slide. Um, so basically a case study is going to work with a horse using your surefoot pads and videoing that, that process and then filling out a case study sheet. Um, and the reason we require them is what, what we find is that even though you know certain things, um, we have habits, just like horses have habits. And one of the things Surefoot does is make the horse's habits more obvious. Case studies make our habits more obvious. And so there may be things that we didn't think about or we didn't notice because it's so familiar. And when Joe looks at the case study, she points out, wow, this person's standing in the kick zone. And yeah, the horse is really relaxed and quiet and looks really sleepy, but what if that horse over there whinnies and this horse gets nervous and kicks out and boop, you're in the kick zone because you were busy talking to somebody about what was going on with Surefoot. So it's really just um, getting some eyes on your work and helping you be more attentive and more aware so that we all stay safe. So safe, success, support. That's really what we're about. We want everybody to be really safe we want to support everybody, including the horses, the horse owners, and the surefoot practitioners in process and already existing. And uh, we want everybody to be successful. So one of the things, you know, is a common question is, well, my horse wouldn't stand on surefoot pads or my horse didn't like the pads. And really uh, what we find is that person hasn't taken a moment to look a little more closely at what's going on. And I'm talking about owners at this point. Um, Maybe the horse stepped off, but, you know, the horse is standing there and starts to let down. Um, maybe the horse fell off. Uh, maybe there were some flies that caused the horse to step off. So instead of just saying my horse doesn't like it, um, we need to look deeper and ask deeper questions. And that's where case studies can really be helpful in helping us have language and ways to talk about that. So um, it's just really useful. That feedback is really useful just in terms of critiquing ourselves and, and um, having a better rapport with our customers and with the horse. Um, uh, one other thing that, um, is that the last, last slide? I think the last slide is just a thank you and any questions. Oh, yeah. yeah okay, so if you unshare the one other thing I'm going to yeah. talk about, um, sure. Because we're getting really close. I've been working on this workbook now. Um, to be honest, I've been working on it for about 10 years um, and two years. <laughs> so um, when I've looked back in my computer, I can see stops and starts. I'm trying to write the Surefoot workshop workbook for a long, long time. Um, and patience is a virtue sometimes, and it always winds up in the end being better than what you expected instead of just something fast. Um, so we are nearing the end of the layout process for the Surefoot workbook. Um, it is designed for the public at large, but as a practitioner, this is a just a marvelous uh, piece of media that you can use with your clients because one of the things that's so important is that when we start to educate the client to ask questions and to be more observant, then we make it better for the horse. Um, I was literally talking to a practitioner yesterday and she was, had this woman, a top dressage rider, you know, my horse didn't like the pads. And it's like, so she was like, well, what do you mean by that? Um, and then she went out and helped this woman and pointed out all the things that the practitioner saw when the horse was, when she was working with the pads that the owner missed, like totally missed. And the practitioner was able to tell the owner all the problems she's had when riding that horse, the training issues. And she's like, how did you know that? Well, she knew that because the practitioner has become a very good observer. And that's the key to all of this um, is that nothing exists until you observe it. You know, you can walk around your entire house looking for the keys to start your car, but until you realize they're right in your hand, you still can't start that car. So <laughs> It's true. You've done it. I know you're doing it. <laughs> glasses and they're on top of your head. That's why I have a string now. You know? <laughs> so, um, so the thing is, 
so often we're so close to it, we don't see it. But as we become better observers and we're guided in that observation to notice, wow, look at that horse. He's always standing. I, I just had this horse the other day. I was like, they walked him out of the stall and I said, does he always stand like that? There was a leg at, in every different possible place. And they're like, yeah. And this is the horse that's the pain in the butt that's always fiddling around and fooling around. And I'm like, well, that's kind of obvious when you look at how he's standing. And then we started with the pads and I, I had to point it out to him because in like five minutes he was standing square. And if you're busy talking to the person, this stuff happens and nobody notices. So, it, so you lose that value right? That suddenly this horse is standing square and suddenly he's not messing with the chain anymore. Or I so remember this reigning horse I had in New Zealand. We went, um, we went to Equidays in New Zealand. Uh, Robin Hood and I, we shared a booth and I went to do a demo and I had this tiny 10 by 10 grassy area in this tent and they forgot to bring me a horse. And so they finally, you know, I'm standing there, I'm entertaining the crowd and everything. Um, and they bring this reigning horse and in less than a minute, I told the guy exactly the problems he was having with this horse based on my observations. And he couldn't believe it. He's like, how did you know that? I'm like, it's right there in front of me. But that's the key. That's what the workbooks are gonna be about, what the practitioner training is about, what working with your clients is about, is the more we can observe and recognize and then provide an opportunity for change, then possibilities exist. But until we observe it, there isn't a possibility of change. And so we're just caught in this trap of, of over and over dealing with the horse that won't stand still or dealing with the horse that can't pick up the left lead or dealing with the horse that, you know, uh, just is, is always fussy. But when we start to learn to observe, then we can see exactly why these things are happening. And believe me, your clients will be amazed that you see this stuff because they just don't. We're not taught to be good observers. And that's such a foundation of Surefoot is, um, and the one of the first questions I had to, to figure out how to answer is teaching people to see what I see because that's where the magic is. The minute you see it, you can do something about it. If you can't see it, you can't do anything about it. So the workbook is coming. Um, the second one is in writing the book, which is the why and and um, what what is Surefoot and why Surefoot is in process. I'm hoping that we can get the photos for it this summer. So believe me, there's a lot of stuff in the pipeline in addition to this, all the stuff that Leslie's working on um, and the changes we're making and how we're gonna track everybody so that we can have a nice presentation for you and make it simple and easy for you to go through the process um, and getting more workshops. So yeah, we've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's exciting and I can't wait. And, you know, I'm, I, we feel like we've, we, you know, we lost last year, but in effect, we really needed the year to keep um, getting some of the administrative stuff done so that it's uh, a more uh, pleasant experience for everybody going forward. All right. So those of you out there, if you have any questions, just pop it in the chat or the Q&A. Um, Christy, is there anything I haven't answered or need to answer? I know that you're out there. Um, and be happy to answer that. Let's see. Um, Again, just everybody, please, 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 if you have not already applied and you want to apply to be a practitioner, please fill out the application, even if you don't see, um, you know, a Surefoot workshop in your neck of the woods yet. You know, we're we're working on it. Thanks, Christy. Uh, when can I get some? <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, the, we've got a lot of stuff. We're really looking forward to 2022. Um, we're also about to come out with the hay soaker. I'm heading off to Hoof Summit this week coming. Um, so we're going to cram in that webinar on the case studies uh, on Monday. I think we're going to do that. And then we head off to um, Cincinnati to go to Hoof Summit. Um, we just got a phone call. I just have to tell you all this. We got a phone call from Jeff Stubblefield and we met Jeff. It's got to be six years ago now at a at an expo. And we gave him a farrier pad. It was called farrier pad back then. We call them physio pads now. And he called us up to tell us how excited he still is about using his pad and how helpful it is and how he works on all these really fancy stars horses down in Nashville, like, you know, all the top stars and I think it's Dollywood now. Um, and he just cannot thank us enough 
for making his life better and helping him work on really difficult horses. So, you know, it's that kind of stuff that really keeps us going. Brad was all jazzed up and we want to go down and visit him. And <laughs> um, it's really great. That, and that's the goal that we want to help more horses be comfortable and more owners have a great partnership with their horse. So thanks everybody for tuning in. Thank you, Leslie, for all your hard work. I want to say that in public, you've been doing a fantastic job and uh, I keep throwing more stuff at her and she just marches right through it. And um, we're really <laughs> looking forward to, to this year and uh, moving forward and, and uh, yeah, that's, that's it. All right. Great. Well, thank you. And we will keep in touch as things roll out and yeah, and feel free to, you know, pop us a question anytime, yeah. info at surefootequine.com. You can go there and fill out the contact form, you know, just get in touch with us. And, and oh, I forgot to take Facebook, you know, make sure you join the Fans of Surefoot um, Facebook group. Yes. Um, we have a group for practitioners and we have a group for practitioner applicants to help them along. And Joe chimes in there and talks about case studies and stuff. So you can find us on Facebook fans of Surefoot, the Surefoot page, the applicants page, and the practitioner page once you're a practitioner. Um, we want to, we thank you all for joining us on this journey, and we're just really excited to, to do more. Oh, great. And Christy just popped up the Facebook Thanks, page there. Thank you, Christy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. So we'll see you next week, and we'll talk about case studies, and thanks, everybody, and uh, hang in there. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye.